Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. This evening, watches you can't afford not to buy. New watches at Geneva Watch Days. All that we chat live plus viewer wrist chats. Check out the redesigned homepage of thewatchbox.com and maybe consider picking up a watch. After all, it is my highly expensive Patreon page. More or less, those guys pay for these pixels. What else is going on in the box? Edward Ledden of Sweden, Joseph Zamora from California, John N. Simon Holt, Richard Combs from South Florida, and the good doctor from Palm Beach. Guys, join me on Instagram. It is my other video platform. Lots of fun stuff, 60 second formats. If you want a quick review of a watch or you want to watch my newest feature, the weekly unwind, check that out. Three watches at a time, all one take. Fun with the most impressive watches we have in the collection. It's always complications, indies, rarity, and vintage. So check out Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. All right, Norm M from California, Dark Star from Orlando, Florida. We got Scott Wexland from Westchester, James Fernandez from Denver. We have Enrique Cassiano, and we have Gail Mibson, Burning Mr. B, Brick Lane, John Goodman, Joshua K, and Eric Nielsen from Asheville, North Carolina. Andre is staying up late with us in London, and we've got Michalis, who is joining us alongside Eric Rudout, Ethan Davis, Zaffer, and Mark S. from Brooklyn. By the way, Michalis, thank you so much for following this show. I appreciate that. There might be some Chopek content in this episode. First, viewer wrist shots. David T. of California shoots a Rolex his and hers with one, two, three, four, five, six Ferrari F50s. That's the kind of thing that happens during Monterey Car Week. Tom B. starts the weekend with his Patek Philippe Calatrava 6006G. Looking good. That is one of my favorite Calatravas. Yukai captures the Hong Kong skyline with his Patek Philippe 6119G. And Jeffrey C. wins the incomparable Black Dial VC's Self-Winding Award. Anyone who sends a picture of that watch wins that award for this episode because it is a personal favorite of mine. We have Paolo M. of Philadelphia who showcases his AP Royal Oak chronograph on a business day, looking good. And Robert A. of Long Island stuns with his rose gold gradient dial AP code 1159 flyback chronograph. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your wrist on my list. Okay, Chaz from the Berg saying, Happy Monday, Tim. We've got Antelope 1013. We've got Eric Hobbs, who's glad to be viewing, and I'm glad he is viewing. We've got Just in EDC from West Virginia in the United States, and we've got Kevin E. from Sydney waking up early in Australia. Keystar G60, I see you there. All right, watches you can't afford not to buy. A lesson I learned from my youth, and truth be told, also in young adulthood. Oftentimes, there were cool old cars and those were the cars that I wanted. I didn't want new cars when I was a kid. I was car obsessed, but I didn't want the new stuff. I wanted old things. 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, that was my bag. And I used to track sales listings for 1957 and 1958 Chrysler letter cars. They were the AMGs of their day. Old guys at the time sold them to each other for 15 to 20 grand all day long on specialist websites before the days of cars.com, Auto Trader, and Carvana. Today, they're like 70 to $100,000 if you want one like that, and up to $200,000 for a convertible. I knew what I wanted at the time, but the lack of means meant I missed my window to buy these things before they were discovered. And they were discovered, and in the era of bring a trailer, they are now unobtainable. So don't be like me. When you know you found an unrecognized watch, something cool but not yet hyped, and you know that it's only a matter of time until the secret's out, don't wait forever if you love it. Don't be like the younger version of me. Go out and get that cool watch. The cost of not buying the watch literally might be that you can't afford its price once the hoding keys and auction houses of the world rain on your parade. So here are some unrecognized, or I should say underrecognized, because they're known, but they haven't yet hit boiling point yet. 
under-recognized watches we will all wish we bought, starting with a relatively recent one from 2016. If you recall that year, it was the third generation debut for the Vacheron Constantin overseas. The third generation was all new. For the first time, we get Geneva Hallmark movements, we get display case backs, and we get a bunch of manufacturer calibers. This one did not have a manufacturer caliber. It was also the rarest of the third generation. It is the Overseas Ultra Thin. White gold, no date, and I would say it was sort of a taupe sunburst dial. 40 millimeters in diameter, only 7.6 millimeters thick. It was ultra thin, and that largely due to the lack of a date. It had the great caliber 1120 based on the old JLC a Bausch 920. It had swappable straps, and of course that beautifully balanced, perfectly balanced, no date dial. It retailed for 55,750. We've had this watch once, and in eight years I've been doing this, I can't say that there are many mainstream brand watches from Richemont companies that I've only had once. That is the watch on my wrist. And we sold it for right around what it retailed for, which told me that back in 2019 when we sold that watch, the market had not gone nuts. Right now on Chrono24, eBay, you won't find any of them for sale. So I can only guess at what it might sell for today, but I'm also willing to make a definitive statement on the matter, which is that Patek made 170 of these. And from my sources, Vacheron made fewer than 100 of the overseas ultra thin. So you could pay four to six million dollars for one of the Dash 18 5711s, or you could go out and buy a rare Vacheron that is even scarcer, more special, less cloying and contrived, keep that watch and enjoy it long term, and if the time comes, retire to a glorious penthouse when you sell the thing at auction. But here's where you don't want to be. You don't want to be looking to get into that watch at a time when the auctions finally realize how rare and special and desirable it is. Buy it to love it, not to sell it, but do buy it if you have the chance, because this one won't be cheap forever. I can see two hundred dollars to $300,000 in the next decade for this watch, and I can maybe even see that happening in the next five years. Once we get past this tentative economic moment, I think that thing is going to be a phenomenon. Okay, Rolex Sea Dweller 116600. Everyone bemoaned the end of the 40 millimeter Sea Dweller when the Deep Sea arrived and killed the 40, as they said, back in 2008. Well, the Deep Sea might have done in the original 40, but it wasn't the end of the line for that case size. At Basel World 2014, Rolex launched this 40 millimeter Sea Dweller, and in a lot of ways, this is the modern steel Rolex sports watch to buy. Why? Because they only made it from 2014 to 2017, and for a Rolex steel sports watch, that is a hell of a short run. They made the Cellini Prince for almost a decade, just by comparison. Now this thing is gorgeous, because in a lot of ways, it's not only the last of the 40 millimeter Sea Dwellers, but it doesn't have the Cyclops eye that creates a visual imbalance on something like a Submariner. And that might have been the downfall of the newborn 4000. The Sea Dweller 4000, as you see it here, looked too much like a Submariner for some people's tastes. It wasn't super thick, it wasn't super large, and aside from the lack of the Cyclops and the presence of a helium valve, it really did look like the substantially cheaper Submariner, which at the time retailed for well under $2,000 less. So a lot of folks didn't see the reason to pay an original retail price of $10,400 for this watch back in 2014. And that was its downfall. It looked like an expensive sub. Today, it's rare, it's special. And if you ask people what they want in the long run, they may pretend to like haute horlogerie and independent brands, but everyone loves steel, wearably sized Rolex dive watches. That's what you have here. Consider that retail price of $10,400 back in 2014. Today, with inflation adjustments, that's over $13,000. So, the fact that you can buy these all day long for like 18 grand tells me that this is a watch whose moment has yet to come. As scarce as it is, and as 
core as it is to Rolex identity, this isn't a dress watch, this isn't a small watch, this isn't a ladies watch, this isn't a quartz watch, this is what the Rolex collector wants in the long term. And as rare as they are, I can't see them selling for like half the price of a steel ceramic Daytona forever. Look at the steel ceramic Daytona market, people say, oh pfft, the bottom's fallen out of it. It's a $14,550 watch that sells, well, if it's a white dial, for like 35 grand. That's nuts. They're still making that watch. They're not making this one. That's why I see an opportunity. Buy one to wear and enjoy, buy one to put in the safe. That's the benefit of this thing costing half as much as a steel ceramic Daytona. So if you're looking at a 116500LN Cosmograph, get two of these instead. You'll thank me later. All right, Grubel 4C, double tour beyond 30 degrees, early models, the earliest ones, and the earliest ones looked like this. Uh, this is some photos I took for an article I wrote for Quill and Pad. If you want to go read about it, please do. The watch, in its earliest iterations, truly was the breakthrough piece by Grubel and Forsey when they launched under their own names in 2005. In a lot of ways, the idea of having two tourbillon, one a four-minute tourbillon, one a one-minute tourbillon, the inner one angled at 30 degrees, completely unprecedented as a horological concept. This was not a tourbillon designed for peacocking, although frankly it does. This was a tourbillon designed to achieve chronometry and tested against the clock, the regulator clock that is. This watch actually won the Laloque chronometry trials against watches that were built only for chronometry trials. So it's actually a winner in timing contests. It's not just beautiful, which makes it different from so many tourbillon watches today, which are just designed to be eye candy. Now you know you're looking at one of the earliest versions if you turn it over on its side and it looks like it has a strip of mustard. That's a little sine wave on the case designed to reference what's going on with the movement. And it's important to say, I don't think $270,000 watches as a rule are great bargains, but you have to look at the horological significance significance and rarity of these. In the early days, not only was it a breakthrough watch for one of the great modern independents, it was their premier model, their first fundamental innovation, and they're only building a few dozen pieces in those early years. So these early models are really rare. Look at a comparable first model from another important indie. If you can't see the price there, it's $1,100,000. And that's a third series tourbillon remontoire. That's not even a souscription piece. That is one of the later versions. So all I'm saying is the Grubel is better finished, more innovative, probably less common because after all if you include the ruthenium series watches over 400 of those original tourbillon remontoire were made i doubt that many of these were made in the first couple of years of grubel forcey and it's a more interesting watch to look at because journes in the early days at best were crude today they're clinically perfect but they're also largely machine finished this never will be also tourbillon watches from grubel forcey Again, they deliver. Look at that structure. Look at the depth of it. It was designed to keep excellent time, which is what we all hope our near $300,000 watch will do for us. Want to buy one of these new today? They range from about $430,000 to $730,000. So you can get one of the originals, the scarcest, the most innovative, the most horologically and historically important for a lot less than that. Do I think it'll last forever? No. But if you've got the money and the inclination and you're not a shy man and you don't have a tiny wrist, this could be a fun way to spend the price of a nice Midwestern American house. All right, Zenith. Here is a value proposition. This is not for those who have seven, six, or even five figure watch budgets. But it's a damn cool piece, and with fewer than 500 examples of the late 1990s Zenith El Primero Rainbow Mango Divers made, you're looking at a watch that's scarcer even than something like a first generation Patek Philippe Nautilus. All versions of the 3701 were made eh, about 3,300 to 3,500 copies. Somewhere between 470 and 500 of these were made, and they are the works. So let's say fewer than 500 were made. It's part of the Rainbow series, which despite the 
misconception that they're named after the rainbow dialed and bezeled version. They're actually named after the rainbow yacht that won the America's Cup back in the 1930s. Now that we're past that, you can see why this watch is a diver and not an aviator's watch. It is an aquatically themed timepiece. This is a watch that has a lot of charm between the mango of the dial, the El Primero movement, the lovely and anachronistic 90s style bracelet, and the fact that this is an original tritium dial watch and tritium bezel. It is very, very special. It's, oh, let's take a look. It's basically a three-way cross. If you spliced the DNA of a Doxa Sub, a 1990s Rolex Daytona, and a Zenith El Primero, it is the mashup watch of your dreams. And at 40 millimeters in diameter and under 12 millimeters thick, it is beautifully wearable. And they go for between $3,000 and $5,000. So prices, even with a bracelet, even with box and papers, still quite reasonable. So if you ever wanted a Doxa Sub 300 slash Zenith El Primero slash 1990s Tritium Dial, Rolex Daytona cross splice. This is that hybrid. And the watch is absolutely the bomb. In an era when Zenith made only a few hundred pieces of most major references, it enjoys real scarcity. Today, in the LVMH era of Zenith, everything is mass produced. Not back then. This thing is a real prospect for the future. Okay. Let's talk about a watch that is basically the same thing as two Bollywood references that cost way too much money. The IWC Ingenieur SL, the reference 1832, sometimes known as the Jumbo Ingenieur, made from 1976 to my birth year of 1984. It was the third major Gerald Genta design of the 1970s. It's often classed alongside the Patek Philippe Nautilus 3700 and the AP Royal Oak 5402. But unlike those, this watch actually had a purpose. It was a technician's watch, highly water resistant, highly anti-magnetic, and it was the only one of the three that actually had the manufacturer's own movement inside it, an IWC 85 series. So at 40 millimeters in diameter, it's got a nice beefy case size that still wears well even today. Do you want a 1970s Patek Philippe 3700? You're going to pay a lot of money for it. How about a 1970s APA series Royal Oak 5402? Mm, those go dear. But how about a watch that Gerald Genta designed alongside them? The only one with the manufacturer movement, a 40 millimeter case, anti-magnetic qualities. The only one made in just a handful of examples, less than 600, all versions, gold and steel. Remember, there are thousands of 5402s. There are two A-series of 1,000 with the initial Royal Oak. There are over 3,000 Nautilus 3700 jumbos in the world. There are only about 550 of these in steel. How about original tritium dials? They're beautiful. And the dial motifs of those early ingenieurs were just as gorgeous. How about all of this for less than the price of a new Royal Oak? Yes, they're available, many of them, in great shape right now. Don't miss out. That's my advice. Someday these things will be discovered. They won't cost 30 grand or 40 grand, that's for sure. All right, let's see what's going on in the box right here. Guys, viewership is doing well. Let's see if we can get this thing up to 500 because we're about to talk about Geneva watch days and 2022 models. Let's talk about Detroit Spartan, Jean-Claude Beaver, William Rizzo. We've got Dark Star. We've got Brian E. from London, Geezer, and Eric Nielsen in the box. I'm glad to see all of you. And wrist shots number two, starting with Benny B. and his Rolex Skydweller annual calendar, GMT, with Porsche on the open road. Well, hmm, normally we would have wrist shots right here. Do we have Chris B. of Indonesia? Up oh, there he is. Okay, Benny's back. Rolex Skydweller annual calendar GMT. You see, Sean is the hero back there. He's scrambling and he makes it happen as I'm sitting here tapping my toes. He's the man. Okay, I love it. White gold Skydweller GMT annual calendar chronometer and Porsche. The best of the best. Chris B of Indonesia welcomes his new Rolex Sea Dweller two tone out on the town in Singapore. You can see the Marina Bay Sands in the background. We have George Y reporting from Seattle with his watch box bought Rolex Explorer 2 patina dial, 16550. George, thank you for trusting our company. We have Benjamin B in Florida with his Tudor Pelagos and Atticus the dog out on the beach. We have Jeffrey B 
who enjoys a colorful drink and a colorful watch with his green strap and Rolex Milgauss Z Blue. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com and while you're at it, List your Instagram handle too, so I can tag you. Okay, dear Tim, we've got a question from Clive. What can we expect from Geneva Watch Days 2022? Well, we now know, we have a partial answer. It continues through September, but a couple of new watches have been released. So Clive, thank you for reaching out. First, let's be clear about what Geneva Watch Days is not. It isn't Watches and Wonders, and it isn't S-I-H-H. -H. The S-E-H-H, is gone, it's history, but it was largely funded by Richemont to roll out watches from Vacheron, Langa, Panerai, IWC, JLC, and others. So Richemont created SIHH in the early 90s basically as a Richemont group benefit. Watches and Wonders is mo much closer to what the old SIHH was, and Richemont still runs the show. So much so that it's being promoted on Richemont's website. You can see right there, they were posting in July that news for the next Watches and Wonders will break shortly. It's definitely happening, and Richemont is still basically paying for the cost of the whole thing. Uh, but I will say this, it was held this past spring in Basel's old calendar slot. SIHH used to be in January, Basel used to be the end of March, beginning of April. That is now where Watches and Wonders sits. But Watches and Wonders this year, critically, also incorporated Patek Philippe and Rolex, which moves the show closer to a merger of what used to be Basel World and SIHH in the Basel World time slot. So, SIHH was held in the Pal Expo, which is a huge convention center near the Geneva airport that was built for the Geneva Auto Show. In comparison, Geneva Watch Days, if you actually look at where it's happening, it's a dispersed event hosted mostly in and around the major hotels lining the city's inner harbor on Lake Geneva. The brands included at Geneva Watch Days are almost entirely independent, small, or at the most mid-sized, like for example, an Oris or a Doxa. So, the entire show is comparable to what used to be called the Carré des Horlogères at SIHH, basically the corner for the indie watch brands, and that's exactly what Geneva Watch Days is. So, the launches include a few fun novelties from a few of our favorite indies, including Grubel Forcey, expanding the Convex collection that they debuted last year. These are sports watches now. We have the GMC Balancier Convex. Just the facts now. 43.5 millimeters in diameter, titanium grade five. That's both the movement bridges and plates and the case. It is 100 meters water resistant. It is a manual wind, three day power reserve. It is a dual time with world time. It will cost $400,000, they're gonna make 66, but only 22 a year for the next three years, so it's not like they're gonna crank them out all at once. Grubel's probably gonna make between 150 and 200 watches this year, so they wanna make sure that half that production is in a sports watch. That done, let's talk features. You get a global 24-hour time display that relies on a spherical titanium hand-decorated globe. Now, if you're good at lining up your imaginary meridians, you will be able to use the 24-hour ring around it as a world time. That said, we're not done. There is also a secondary time zone, which you can see peeking in from the left side. So you've got your primary time, you've got world time, and then you've got a true secondary time zone. The hours and minute hands for the primary time zone are orbital. They actually rotate around the globe. And then you can see that secondary time zone off to the side, making the reading of a secondary time zone a lot more intuitive than visualizing the time on the globe. Finish is world class. You can see it everywhere from the completely rounded and specular finished black polished balance bridge to the rustication and the texturing of the grade five titanium bridges and plates. The screws are the proverbial 100 Swiss franc screws because of how much time and effort they take to create. A second time zone sits right over at nine o'clock and if you look just below that, you can see the signature oversized angled balance that has been on Grubel 4C watches since the very beginning and the tourbillons. 
We have the case back that simplifies the world time setting and reading as we now have 24 principal time zones represented by reference cities lacquered on a sapphire disk. You have summertime read from the central scale. You have standard time read from the outer scale. Again, for setting and reading the world time, this is really how you're going to do it. You're not going to use the globe. And all of this is quite intuitive. The watch is designed to be user friendly, comfortable and polyvalent. So you don't have to worry about shocking it or getting it wet. This is a new world for Grubel 4C and I'm not going to lie, they are relying on sports watches to help them move beyond their historic 100 to 150 pieces a year. They'd probably like to double that and get up to 300 and they're going to do it with the Convex collection. So there will be more in this collection. Stay tuned. All right, what's going on? We've got Danny joining in from Israel, staying up late with me. I love it. We've got Jeremy D. Good to have watch goals. We've got Luis Q saying, Woke up in Guangzhou to this episode. Thank you for getting up early in China with me. Guangzhou, that is that is an early morning for you. We got Christopher H saying, holy moly, that Grubel 4C is ridiculous. Thomas Burnett, amazing technology, but a bit discombobulating to look at. We got Demetrius saying a nice thing about me, which I hugely appreciate. Greetings from Cyprus. He's also staying up late from the Mediterranean. Gotta love it, guys. All right, now, MBNF, the Legacy Machine Split Escapement Evo. It's no secret, indies are pushing hard into sports watches. In just the last year, we've seen new sports watches from Grubel Forsey, from Long Untaina, from Chapek, from MBNF, from Romain Gautier. It is the thing today. This is the Legacy Machine Split Escapement Evo. Evo means sports watch. So in keeping with the MBNF Evo line, a previous dress watch is redesigned to gain 80 meter swimmable water resistance, internal shock absorbers, so you can basically punish the watch, and an integrated rubber strap with a new case. The original late 2017 Split Escapement design was a Stephen McDonald collaboration that separated the dial side balance wheel from the case back lever escapement and it was gorgeous but MBNF has rotated the movement to change the balance of the dial but the caliber on the reverse side remains artisanal and traditional manual wind two barrels power reserve is 72 hours a date and a power reserve indicator are present on the dial, so there's a little bit of complication. Case size is 44 millimeters in grade 5 titanium, so it's going to be very light and it's going to be very scratch resistant. Dial options include the light blue that you just saw and a black dial 25 piece limited edition for an upcoming MBNF lab outlet in Beverly Hills. Pricing will be $80,000 for both versions of the watch. Whether it's the LE or the standard model, it's going to be 80 grand in US dollars. Availability soon, and of course, max being max, I'd be shocked if that's the end of it, but we'll probably see a couple of different case materials and different dial colors. Okay, Chapek. These are the underdogs everyone loves to root for. The folks who run it love watches. The stakeholders who hold stock love watches. And the fans actually get a lot of feedback in what they make and how they make it. This one is an evolution of the company's first watch from 2015, the Kedeberg. So, the Spunky Independent is inaugurating a new manufacturer in Le Chaux de Fonds with the intent to scale up production from about 150 watches a year to about 800 watches a year, and they want to reduce waiting times. That is the Achilles heel of independence today, so the new manufacturer isn't going to produce more watches than they have orders, it's just going to help them better match production to the orders. We have two dials in vivid colors, emerald green L and sapphire blue L. What are they? Well, each dial combines what they call a ricochet guilloche pattern that is cut on a traditional rose lathe with a translucent lacquer to create what's often described as a flinke effect. When you have a translucent lacquer or translucent enamel on guilloche, it is called flinke and it has a wonderful depth to it. Donze Cadrin, which is a dial company owned by Ulysse Nardin, is fabricating the dials and Chapek is proud of it. They always announce the folks that make their parts, their partners, like for example, Chronode, Metalem, or Donze Cadrin, always get acknowledged and I love it. If you're an etablisseur, celebrate great suppliers. Don't pretend you do it all yourself. 
So, Caliber SXH01 receives an architectural redesign. You now get a free sprung balance that makes it a little bit tougher and easy to adjust precisely. Bridges are more open and revealing. You can see they've been evacuated a bit and skeletonized. The train wheels are more visible and they're now using what are sometimes called partridge eye or olive profile jewels that are necessary to get hallmarks such as Calité Fleurier or Geneva hallmark. This watch doesn't have that yet, but they're laying the groundwork, I think, for a future edition with those new jewels. Here's the original movement, so you can see how it looked originally, uh, particularly the drivetrain leading down from the second barrel is less visible, and the open bridges on the new version of the movement just make it a little bit more enjoyable to loop. Now. Power reserve remains seven days, so rest assured, the tech specs are exactly the same. Pricing will be approximately 18,600 US dollars, and the case is gonna be 42.5 millimeters in stainless steel. So it's big for a dress watch, but it is a gorgeous watch. I would call it a sporty dress watch. So it's about average in size for a sports watch. Think of it along those lines, and the size starts to make sense. Okay, let's jump back to our chat box. We've got Jem Hader saying, big Chopek fan, one day I'll own an Antarctique. We've got Iskander saying, celebrate suppliers, don't pretend you made it all yourself. That sounds so refreshing. It really is. And then right here, we've got Pete's timepiece safari, staying up late in the Balkans in Croatia. I appreciate that. Time Hill, Chopek is incredible. A Mick in Florida saying, beautiful, but legacy machine is for me. And I don't blame you. These are all great watches. Viewer's shots number three, jumping straight in with Dylan L, a longtime supporter of all my my social media. He's got his Tudor Pelagos. He's got his Rolex Air King. He's got his IWC Pilot's Watch Chronograph Spitfire. I love it. Guys, send me your loom shots, especially when they're that good. We have Derek D and his Tudor Black Bay Chronograph Panda reporting from the Hard Rock in Tenerife on vacation. We've got Abdul R who holds a PhD in engineering, engineering some vacation time with his Casio in Egypt. We've got Hunter M, who's a man after my own heart with his Mustang 5.0 and Speedmaster Racing. You can see he's done a few mods to that S550 Mustang. And Mikal B of Poland rolls with his Breitling Avenger GMT Night Mission and Volvo. Staying safe. Send your viewer wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com and include your Instagram hashtag. Okay, Geneva Watch Days continued. A bit of a revival. We all love a comeback. We've seen a couple of them in recent years. Laurent Ferrier was on the mat. At one point, Debetun was close to bankruptcy, and Haute-Lance was basically dissolved as a going concern. But with the right management, some seed money, and a little bit of help from their friend, Haute-Lance is back with two new watches that leverage its MELB Moser link. So this is the Linear One Series One, which combines Haute-Lance's signature case shape with a movement fundamentally based on Moser's HMC 804 automatic flying tourbillon with double hairsprings. The Linear has all of that plus two retrograde scales, one for hours, one for minutes, an unconventional retrograde as you can see, based on a complication module created by Agenor, which is a August and esteemed complication and movement specialist. This watch is automatic winding with 72 hours of power reserve. Water resistance is a useful 100 meters and the steel case measures 50.8 by 43 millimeters. It's only 11.9 millimeters thick. The 28 piece limited edition, and that will be the initial edition, there will be other series, is priced at approximately $61,000 US, which seems like a good value for the amount of high horology the com complexity that you get, and also the rarity of the watch. Uh, this is a cool watch, stay tuned. I hope to have one relatively soon for videos. So if you're not following me over on Watchbox Reviews, definitely do that, because I know for a fact this watch is coming to my office and I'm gonna do a full hands-on with retrograde action. Okay, also new is the Vagabond Series 4. A familiar name from the world of FP Journe, Haute Lance has been making Vagabond Wandering Hours watches for a number of years as the first one came out in 2018. Moser fans will recognize the C806 movement at the heart of the Endeavor Flying Hours model in Haute Lance packaging. However, an aperture style hour display significantly simplifies the process of reading time, which, if we could jump back for a second, was a major drawback of the original Moser design. Sometimes you would see two hours at once, and it was not intuitive. The dial of the new 
Oatlands Vagabond is frosted and rhodium plated, which is just gorgeous. It twinkles like diamond dust. Moreover, the Vagabond's steel case and 100 meter water rating improve its practicality compared to the precious metal Mosers, which are just 30 meters rated. The 28 piece initial edition will be priced at a number to be ascertained. It hasn't been released just yet, but we expect to see it by the end of the Geneva Watch Days show. Probably going to be somewhere around half as much as the Tourbillon, if I had to guess. So consider this a hard relaunch for the brand. Georges-Henri Melon and his sons, Edward and Bertrand, acquired Oatlands in 2012, right around the time they were picking up Moser. Uh, they are a management group run by business professionals, very different from the kind of creative folks and starry-eyed dreamers who often start watch brands and run them into the ground. So the Melans resurrected Moser. Their next project is going to be Haute Lance. Haute Lance was a standout indie back during the 2000s. Founded in 2004, it focused on rectangular watches with big size, jumping displays that were either jump hours or retrogrades. And it had a lot of success in its early years, but lost its way in the 2010s with successive years of weak sales, uh, personnel changes, uh, upheaval within the brand, and frankly, they didn't have the best marketing at the time. Previously, highly complicated Moser watches would draw on Oatlance for movement help, as Oatlance made many in-house calibers, and that was probably one of the reasons they failed. They tried to make too much in-house too quickly. Well, the reverse is gonna be true today. Economies of scale, shared tooling, and costs will allow Oatlance to use Moser movement bases to get back on its feet as a brand. But as you saw with the Vagabond time display, as well as the linear, they're going to put their own stamp on it and they're going to add their own type of complexity on top of the Moser bases. So Sam Hoffman, who's the son of noted watch industry executive Patrick Hoffman, will be running the rebooted Oatlance under the mentorship of Edward Melon and Bertrand Melon. So they've got all the right ingredients, but Full disclosure, of course, Patrick Hoffman is the vice president of Watchbox in Switzerland, and Sam is his son, so I just want you to know, reliable sources, we do know the Hoffmans. Sam used to, I believe, do work for IW Magazine back when we had that. So there is a family connection here, but I know that Oatlance is going to be in good hands. All right, let's see what's going on in the chat box, guys. What's going on? Hans N, Junior Johnson, we've got Neff, and we've got Talking Watches. Time Hill, pronounce JLC correctly and let me know. My best effort is something along the lines of Jeger Le Coult. It is Jeger Le Coult, and it is not Jaeger, because Edmond Jeger fled his home in Alsace-Lorraine during the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Fleeing the Germans and going to Paris, he would not have pronounced his name Jaeger. That's how I know. All right. Mamba and greetings from California. Jumping back, Oris saves the day with a vintage inspired diver that costs real world money. All of these crazy indies and their five and six figure prices. Behold, the Oris Diver's 65 12 hour caliber 400. 40 millimeters in stainless steel and only 12.8 millimeters thick, which is impressive. This vintage homage diver can be ordered on a strap or on a simulated rivet bracelet. This Oris bezel is calibrated to 12 hours and it has a depth rating of 100 meters. That 12 hour bezel is true to original Oris 1965 divers. So this is an historical homage. It's bi-directional as well. So this is not a modern day ISO diver. It's seen as more of an adventurer's watch with the intent being that you will use the bezel either to calculate a second time zone or to use it to time extended intervals of hours, not minutes. But it's the movement with its five-day power reserve that really sets this apart. Did I say five-day power reserve? How about a 10-year service interval? How about Oris putting its money where its mouth is with a 10-year warranty? Rolex, Patek, Omega, are you listening? You better be, because this thing is the full package. They even guarantee accuracy, saying the watch is tested in a chronometer like five positions to run no worse than minus three plus five seconds per 24 hours. Remember, COSC is five positions minus four plus six. This is better. It's also highly anti-magnetic, as they boast it can deal with 2,250 gauss of magnetic flux density for 24 hours and vary by less than 30 seconds. Some have said less than 10 seconds. That's impressive when you consider that 1,000 Gauss 
is Milgauss. A minimal box also helps to keep the price to $3,500 if you get it on the strap or $3,700 if you buy it on the bracelet. And especially on a value priced watch, I am all for decontenting the box in order to get more watch. Okay, right here we have Mick in Florida saying awesome Oris. We've got Steve 1010 saying afternoon Tim, afternoon Steve, good to see you right there. And we've got Simon Holt saying great Oris, they're knocking it out of the park and Hans N says Oris offering great value. Joshua K with a counterpoint, I love the Oris Caliber 400 but can't give up my Tudor Black Bay 58. Mark S saying the box is ugly, that's true but you're not paying a lot of money to get it. You're paying a lot, you're paying all the money essentially for the watch. Plus. If you're like me and you've had a lot of boxes over the years, you realize that they start to take over your home. Remember that Star Trek episode, The Trouble with Tribbles? It's like that. Okay, what's going on? Philip D saying, Oris is a case study on how to watch a watch company. And Rick, a blog to watch saying, looking forward to seeing Oris at the show. We got over 450 in the live chat. Guys, you have made my evening. And you're gonna do it again with viewer wrist shots number four. Andre Z and his Rolex Explorer 242 caffeinate at both uh, what appears to be 748 and 448. We have Stefano R who goes off the beaten path with his Chopard Louis Ulysse Chopard Calité Fleurier. We have Alexander F and his Alanga Unzona homage a Emma Langa moon phase riding Amtrak across the United States of America. Mohammed E and his Seiko ride hot air balloons over the ancient Egyptian city of Luxor, which is very cool. And Matt C of Brisbane, Australia wins our pure photography stakes with this beautifully composed, colored, and toned shot of his Zenith Day Fi. El Primero 21 Ultraviolet with suit, cuff, and coffee. How about staging the cream and the glasses? Man, aviators, this guy thought of everything. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com if you think you can top Matt C of Brisbane. Guys, join me on Instagram. It's always the after party to watch us tonight where you can see my one minute videos and each week on Friday afternoon, The Unwind. Thanks to Sean for making the magic happen. I look forward to recapping all we see at Geneva Watch Days the next time we air, which will not be next Monday because of the U.S. Labor Day holiday. Keep that in mind. I will see you the week after, so don't stay up late, don't get up early. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.